Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we have most of the usual suspects. We've got Dude Buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? I'm feeling very geeky. We, if, if you're not watching the video of this, we both have Star Wars backgrounds, which, you know, I feel like I'm tapping the force. Yeah, I feel like I'm there. It's pretty amazing. It's really cool. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm doing quite well. It's good to see you. We've got the most feared woman in the country, the terrorist hunter, Mimi Schmidt. Mimi, how are you? Doing all right. You doing okay? We're hanging in there. We're hanging in there. Not a day goes by. I'm not grateful for alcohol. And then we got the big papa. I love it when you call me big papa, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you? I'm all right. Starting to get a little bit worn out like everybody else, but uh, I'm okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you've you got a little rougher than I think most of us because of the the youngins. Yeah, they're, uh, they've been giving us a run for our money over the last few days, but uh, huh, it is what it is. It is what it is. And then last but not least, you know him, you love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your, your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm hanging in there. Uh, my wife cut my hair today, so I feel clean. Tate's got a nice haircut. Mm-hmm. Bossman's got his haircut. Eric how do we, how Eric's do we know? looks how do we good. Know? He's wearing a hat. He okay. All right. I was just wondering because he he looks like he could easily be Jeff Lowe with that hat on. I don't know. Oh man, that already already <laughs> throwing okay, punches. Started. Shots it's already, fired. It's shots fired within the two minutes of the podcast. Scott, you're looking looking good. Mimi. You you look like like you've got like you're going to the salon every day. I don't know what's going on over there. It's bigger and bigger, more and I more. Know. I don't know, but but everybody seems to be doing fairly well. Um, I think it'd be a really good way to start the uh, roundtable. Just this week's update: How are things going in the middle of the pandemic for your business? Let's just start with the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman, Scott. How are things going? Things are things are moving along. Things are busy. We've had a couple cash sales in the last week and a couple terms deals in the last week. So it's uh, continues to be uh, busy, and we're purchasing properties. Uh, bought one today. Buying a couple other ones this week. Okay. Wow. Not not bad. Any defaults yet? I still have not had any defaults. Knock on wood. Wow. Uh, the technician, Eric Peterson, what's the state of your land business? Things are going well. Um, had a couple sales over the weekend. Um, we've got a small handful of properties we'll be purchasing this week. Um, things are moving right along. Okay. Wow. Any defaults? Uh, not since the one I mentioned last week. Okay. The terrorist hunter, Mimi Schmidt. How, how's the state of your land business? I own a lot of property, had some good sales, have a note that's getting paid off early today. So I'm still seeing more cash coming in than normal and lots and lots of visits to property. Everyone wants to go look and get out because they can go look at land and social distance at the same time. And the weather's getting nicer too. So that's been great because if they go see it, they're more likely to want to buy it. No, absolutely. I, I mean, you can almost put like as a headline, this this land will keep your sanity. Go out, camp on it, get away. For sure. Um, it's like, would you rather drink a fifth or a camp? Here you go. Yeah. Easy terms. Um, Tate Litchfield, the big papa. How's how's the state of your land business? You know, um, we had somebody pay off the remaining note today, which is kind of exciting. Nice little three thousand uh, dollar double right there. So that's that's kind of cool. But uh, honestly, 
we haven't really seen much change from the last time I kind of gave this. We're, we're seeing a ton of activity, lots of sales happening. Um, it's been a really good month for us, dare I even say record breaking. So, uh, but I don't know for sure. We still got a couple of days left, but uh, we're hustling. So it's pretty, uh, pretty awesome time to be a land investor. And nothing, no, no note defaults yet. No, we had uh, a couple people make adjustments to their notes. Um, I do think I am going to see one, uh, but I can't say for sure it's a result of COVID-19. You know, I, the guy is honestly kind of perpetually late, so it could be a, a variety of different reasons, but uh, I think we are going to have a default with him, and I'm sure he'll claim it was corona. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. With these perennially late people, yeah. And now they're in default and then they're like hustling to get back with you. And they're like, no, 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 no. I want to pay. I want to pay. Do you keep them in default or do you let them, you know, get current? Uh, you know, it's something we'll look at in an in, on a case by case basis. I mean, if somebody ran into a, a difficult few months and they stopped making payments, they absolutely have that right to do so. And if they call us back and say, listen, I can't make the full payment today, but I can pay, you know, last month's and then the late fees, we're going to work with them. You know, we're good people and we want you to get your land. Um, but it's the people that don't communicate with us that are, constantly late. I mean, we've got probably six or seven people who it doesn't matter what month of the year it is. Every single payment is late. Every single one of them. And, uh, it, you know, it doesn't bother me, right? We collect their late fee charge. They're okay with it. I've spoken with them. I've said, Hey, let's pick a new date. Let's pick a new note collection payment. I don't want you guys to pay this. And they say, okay, let's move it to the 15th. 15th will come, payment will fail, hit with a late fee. On the 22nd, they pay plus their late fee. And it's like, all right, that's just the way they operate. No problem. So we're good yeah. guys. No, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the brain, the professor, the flight school Sherpa, Scott Todd, what's the state of your land investing business? Uh, Mark, let's see. It, I will tell you right now, it is in fact a uh, record breaking month of like, by far a record breaking month so far, right? Like, you know, everything else after this is way, way more than, than anything we've ever done. So basically this month is probably double my best month ever prior to this. Like we doubled our best month ever. So uh, not bad. Cash collections is up. Uh, I think by 20% cash collections is up by 20%. So people are paying. I actually had a guy, interesting story. I had a guy that uh, def he, he's been a customer of mine for a long time. I want to say like a few years and he goes through these like waves. Okay. Like he he'll go, he'll pay great. He, he's a great payer. And then all of a sudden he disappears. Like you can't find him. Like he's gone, nothing. And you send the notice of default. And then he comes back and he's like, Hey, uh, I'm back. Hit some rough times. Can I get the property again? And you know, like we, we do operate on a clock, right? Like, you know, this happens and this, ha like you make your payment or you don't make your payment, then this happens, notice default, whatever. But just because we do that and we send through the termination stuff doesn't always mean that we always put the properties back up on the market either. Sometimes we'll hold them because like this guy, he shows back up again, two, three months later. And I'm not necessarily holding it for him, but at the same time, do I really need to go sell that one right now? I mean, like I've got others in my inventory, so it just goes there. And then what happens is it, when he shows back up again, we're like, he's like, Hey, I, can I get the property back? Well, let's see if it's still available. Well, it is because we kind of put it on the side for a little bit. And what we do is we say, Hey, listen, yeah, you can, you can basically pick up where you left off. You have to make two months payment and you have to pay the doc fee. And he's like, okay, let's do it. So we do the doc fee again. He pays two months payment again, and we're back in an active note. So like this guy showed up again and he's got money again. So it's like, let's roll. And we actually had the same property that he wanted still available. So we're like, let's go. So that's the way we, we do it. Like you want to get back in after it's terminated, new doc fee, two months payment, and then we can roll. I, I love it. I love it. I think more people should be doing that. Yeah. Um, because it does, I mean, look, it does take time to, to get these people back in the fold. There's, there's emotional bandwidth at play as well. Just yeah, the I, communication. I, I think that 
I think what happens is, um, you know, if you if you don't, yeah, like, look, there's labor involved in saying these notices, right? Like there's neighbor, labor, labor involved. And yeah, we use systems to do it. But guess what? People have to still do this stuff, okay? Like people have to monitor it and do things. And there is an opportunity cost too, right? Like there's an opportunity cost for me not selling that property. And again, I'm not necessarily saving it for them, but it's not necessarily top of, when I take it off of, um, you know, permitting a deal, unless I have someone like absolutely needing a property like that, well, then I just kind of like put it on the back burner and I'll put it back in when, when the inventory starts to move around a little bit. But, you know, I, I try to be fair to people, but then like if somebody were just to make a couple payments and then vanish on me, I'm not that nice, right? I shouldn't, because like, why? They, they haven't built a relationship. They, they, just, this, they just left. Where this guy, he's, he's paid for a long time. And, you know, I don't want to see him like lose money. So this is what we do. All right. I love it. I love it. Well, we have a really interesting topic to discuss this week. And, um, but before we do, I really need to promote our sponsor and, and thank them for supporting the podcast. Today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Have Scott Todd be your land geek Sherpa up the mountain of land investing. In 16 weeks, you can start creating passive income, more cash flow, really create an entire business. It's a one-time sale. You get recurring passive income every single month. No renters, no rehabs, no renovations, no rodents. Learn more. Just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Schedule a call with the Nightcap OG, dude buddy Scott Bossman, or the Zen Master, Mike Zeno, and see if this model resonates with you. So Scott Todd, what is our topic for the week? You know, Mark, um, I, I kind of get, I kind of get uh, my my blood pumping when I see um, comments like this, and this is from the uh, the Facebook group, and you know, basically someone is is asking on there, you know, they they feel like they're wasting their time by creating training material to do something like due diligence, for example, when um, you know they're not even quite sure not even quite sure of what they need anyway, right? Like they're, they're trying to focus on other things and the comment in there says like, I'm trying to be a land investor, not a VA trainer. And, you know, I, I get it, I understand it. And, you know, so then what happens is they're looking for kind of someone else's VA's training material, okay? Like, hey, any tr training material. Well, due diligence is one that, you know, there are people that, that know how to do this, but I'd love to know everybody else's kind of mindset behind how do you create training documents or how do you create, how do you train VAs to go do something? It can be due diligence or something else. So like, how, how do you train VAs? It's a great, great topic. Scott Bossman, let's start with you. Yeah. So I'm a firm believer. I mean, I, I think a lot of people try to do, they try to outsource too quickly without knowing the, the, every single step in the process. So for me, uh, I need to do it a number of times myself and I need to map out that process line by line by line or use uh, mind mapping uh, software or something like that uh, and then be able to not only write it down but be able to describe it to somebody so be a training video or something like that or talking through it uh, so you got to dial down the process do it repetition 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 and then when it becomes wrote to you um, it's it's time to get rid of it but i think you know you need to have those processes down and uh, i think for me anyway uh, the more these things are mapped out the more linear it seems and feels the better people do things and um that's that's kind of our approach totally makes sense to me absolutely uh the technician eric peterson what are your thoughts yeah, I mean, I do agree that uh, most of the time you're going to have to have a real good understanding of how to do whatever it is that you're asking someone else to do. But there are instances in this business where um, it's not necessarily something that's specific to our business of buying and selling land, and it's maybe a little more general around real estate. And there are people out there that, that might know how to do that stuff already. So in the example of due diligence, um, 
you can probably go out to Upwork and find somebody that knows how to do due diligence without having to educate them on the entire process. Um, you know, I think, I think back to when I first started, um, you know, kind of like Scott just described, you know, I would um, really spend a lot of time on a process and getting it all nailed down and put into a system and, and trying to make it foolproof um, before I would give something to a VA. Um, but I've really learned over time that oftentimes for, again, the right kind of tasks, um, we can, we can kind of take some of that um, building of processes or systems off our plate in a sense by potentially having a, a Zoom call with a VA and just kind of demoing it or maybe just recording yourself doing it and just walking through exactly what you're doing, talking about it as you're doing it. And then just taking that and rather than spending all the time to, to fully document that and put it into something, you know, either hire a VA that can just do that part for you or hire a VA that's going to do the work and actually have them build out that process at the same time. Um, and you can, you know, obviously answer questions as they might come up, but, but you don't have to be the one to build all that out all the time. Yeah, I, I, I love that answer. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd love to know what the terrorist hunter Mimi Schmidt does, she used to manage 150 people. So this is probably like simple for you. The amount of work you do in training is completely tied to how experienced the person you hire is. <laughs> if you are hiring someone who is brand new, you have to teach them from the ground up. And Eric's right, everyone's right. You need to understand what you're doing and have done it enough that you get it, right? To manage Java programmers, you don't have to know how to program in Java, right? But you have to have a basic understanding if there's something that's not right, okay? Same with due diligence. If you want to hire someone who's more experienced, you don't have to create all of these training materials from A to Z. In fact, it's a waste of time and will probably not get used. Because if you've got an experienced person, that means they probably are working with five, seven, ten other investors. And if you impose your program of how you want things done, I want you to use Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever CRM you're using, then they're going to be more likely to make mistakes because they've got 10 different CRMs they're expected to know how to use. Okay. So a lot of these SMEs, you need to macro manage them and let them use what they do, what they're good at and use the tools they know how to use. Right. And then all you're doing is teaching them what is specific that you have to have for your business as opposed to teaching them the A to Z process. I love that. I, I, I wish Mimi had a service where I could outsource my hiring to Mimi. And I could just be like, okay, this is what I need. I need a, a, a due diligence person. Mimi be like, okay, I'll go hire him for you because I, I know what to look for. What do you think, Mimi? <laughs> sounds like take, a lot of work. <laughs> I know. You want to take that on? No. No. I want to be at the beach. Come on. Yeah, that's true. Um, the big papa, Tate Litchfield. What are your thoughts on uh, on all of this? You know, I echo what pretty much everyone else has said. Um, most of the time, what we're doing, it's not rocket science. You know, it's not brain surgery. Get out there, look for somebody who's got the qualities and the skills that you want. Give them a basic outline of what you expect and how you want them to do their job and uh, see what they come back to you with, right? It, it, I mean, you gotta give them some opportunities to prove themselves. And I think let go on the reins a little bit. Um, I've always said, I'm not an expert on anything except hiring experts. And I believe that uh, applies directly to due diligence, right? I, I don't have a degree in due diligence or you know real estate or anything like that. I've, I've learned this all from you know, my mentors and training and experience over the years. And as a result, I've been able to share that knowledge with the VAs that I work with closely, but most of them didn't have a background in this either. So it's been a, it's been a labor of love and taken a lot of time to get these people to where they're at now. And, um, you know, I, I kind of am open to their new ideas and their new approaches and new tools, and I will do whatever I need to and get whatever I need to, to keep them happy and satisfied. So at this point, I trust them. They're really good, but uh, 
you got to have somebody show you what you need to do so you know what the pitfalls are. And I think that's where flight school comes in really helpful. And then as you learn to notice these trends and these pitfalls, you can really start to outsource it to people who uh, do this all day, every single day and feel confident in what they re- they give back to you. Yeah, a- absolutely. So let's give Scott Todd the last word on this. Scott. You know, I, to me, what, what I do, Mark, is whenever I have a, an assignment, one, I don't necessarily assume that they don't know anything, right? I think that's one of the mistakes that people make is they think, oh, I have to prepare the train material because they don't know anything. Well, see, the reality is that people know, know things. That's why you're hiring them, right? Like if you go to Upwork, for example, and you hire someone that has a title abstractor, well, they know how to, how to do this stuff. Now, do they know exactly what you want? No, you have to tell them what you want. You have to tell them. But do you have to document out everything that, that, that you do? No. What I do is I, I get them on a Zoom call, right? Like the first time I'm going to do it, I get them on a Zoom call just like this, me and you. And I share my screen with them and I show them. Like I record it and I show them, okay, this is what I'm doing. And I stutter through it. I point out things. I'm like, oh, well, that's not it. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. It's, it's not a Hollywood production. It's me being me, right? Like it's, it's, it's not polished in any way. It would be no different if you and I were in the same office together and I sat you down right next to me and I shared my screen with you. I'm going to hunt and peck and do whatever. And I'm at the end, I'm going to show them how I come up with the due diligence, right? Like how I do it. And then I'm going to say to them, Hey, why don't you try one here? Try the one that I just did. Okay. Like I do that. Like we just did one together. I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to process the video. I'm going to give you the link so that you can watch the video and do one just like we just did the exact one. Why would I use the exact one? It's because I know what success looks like, right? Like it's, I can see like, this is what I wanted so that when they send me what they're going to send me, I can compare it like, well, this doesn't look right. And then nine times out of 10, there's something wrong. Okay. Like I I was training a VA today and I showed them how to do it. They sent me back something that's wrong. And I'm like, okay, listen, this is wrong. This is wrong please go back and watch the video again and figure out like how you got it wrong. And they did that and they came back to me. Right. And I'm like, perfect. But you see, like the thing is, is that I'm willing to invest the time with them 30 X the time. And what I mean by that, I mean, like if the task takes me an hour, I'm prepared to spend up to 30 hours training them and not just training them, but working with them guiding them, mentoring them. Okay. Like I don't need to write all of the policies and the training manuals. I just need to show them what I'm doing. They will come to the project with their own thoughts in mind and they'll do it their way. But at the end of the day, all I'm looking for is this, and I don't really care what this looks like. And then I would say to them, do you have a better way of doing this? If so, do it. And by the way, please, document what you're doing. Make me a video of what you're doing so I can learn from you. Because after all, I am paying them, right? Like I'm paying, I'm paying for their brain. And when I pay for their brain, I have the right to download the data that's in there that they have. I should be able to learn from them. And if it's not just for me to learn, it's for my next VA to say, Hey, look, look at how this guy did it. Right. And, and maybe this guy's a train wreck, but that's also why I don't just hire one I hire three and I give them the same project, same video, same property due due diligence on. Why? Because one's going to be terrible. One's going to be mediocre and one is going to be a superstar. Yeah. I think we got the title for our podcast, due diligence, outsourcing truth bombs. Right. I mean, these are a lot. I mean, this is a really, really valuable episode. And everyone, everybody said from, from Bossman to Scott is, is really, really important. What I think is interesting is what wasn't said. Mimi Schmidt, you know what wasn't said? Just go to this company here and let them do it. Just, here's a company. This is what they do all day long. Just outsource it to to them. Here's a service. I'm surprised no one's just said, hey, do that. Why not? Why not? I think people want to train people, have people things do that are 
a little more focused on their business, right? A little more attention to detail and, and customized to their business. When you use a service, they're great. There are a lot of great services, but I don't think you get, uh, that person's distracted by a lot of other things too. No, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's it's the difference in philosophy of management in house versus um, outsourcing it. And depending on where you are, I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily going um, to one of these services. But ultimately, if you don't train your own team, your own people, you're not bulletproof, and you're also going to be paying a lot more in the long run as well. So. You know, when you get to be a big company, let's say, let's just use a, a company, that always an in-house counsel. Why? It's a lot less money to have in-house counsel versus going to a, one of these big law firms and paying for legal work every time there's a legal issue and paying $500 to $1,000 an hour versus having your own person there that understands everything intimately and in, in doing that. Does that make sense? Eric Peterson, what do you think? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you can definitely outsource something like due diligence to a service that is out there and, and offers that as a solution. Um, but I think you're exactly right. You're going to pay more money and you don't get kind of the, the customized treatment that, that you might want. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, there's something in due diligence that, that you want to pull that, you know, they don't normally do. It's a lot harder to, to get a service to add something that they don't typically do than it would be for you to train your own VA to just make that part of the process. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think this has been a really, really valuable podcast. And if you agree with me, do us a favor. You've got to subscribe. You have to rate. You have to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. And that way, Mimi Schmidt will continue coming on these podcasts and giving us a tip of the week. Because if you don't do that, like there's, there's weeks where Mimi will go on and be like, you know what, Mark, I'm not coming on this week. No tip. No, nobody's listening. We're not getting any reviews. Um, I'm busy with my own land business. I've got a big life. Like, where's the love? And so I got to, you know, keep doing this. This is all for Mimi and her, her fragile ego. So please do those things. So we are now at that point in the podcast, Mimi, where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go, improve their businesses, improve their lives, what do you got? So this week it's from the Zapier blog and uh, the article is called how to choose the best social media platform for your business. And we get a lot of questions as coaches about other platforms besides Facebook and Craigslist to sell our land on. So the very first thing the article mentions is what social media apps does your audience use? And I think it's interesting. It just reaffirms what we're already doing, YouTube and Facebook, 73, 69% of people use these apps. So do we spend a lot of time trying to market on Instagram and LinkedIn and Snapchat? No, no, we go where the audience is. So I just, I found this an interesting article and then there were some other uh, Zap suggestions farther down too um, that I found interesting. Different ways to use Zapier to automate your business. That's a phenomenal tip. That's really interesting. I, if I had to guess, I, I would have thought those two, you know, the Google and the Facebook, but um, I, you know, Look, I got teenagers in the house and they, they're on TikTok, Snapchat all the time, Instagram. They don't, even fa they don't even mess around with Facebook or, well, they're on YouTube a lot too, but not, not looking at raw land. Right. Necessarily. Right. Even though I'm urging them to, but whatever. It's not here or there. No so um, this has been uh, phenomenal. I want to thank you guys so much. And, um, are we, are we ready to do this? One, two, three, let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. And, and of it. course, wash your hands. Thanks everybody. So Scott Bossman, 
Um, when's Nightcap this week or next week? I should say. No, uh, I think uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern. All right. How are we doing with uh, the flight school? Are we filling up for May? We're 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 filling up for May. We're going to have a full class May 13th. We got people signing up steadily. We had a uh, we have a great, well, it's going to be uh, past the time, but we have a and a plan with Scott Todd next Monday night, which is always uh, an exciting event uh, for people who are interested in flight school. So um, a lot of, lot of interest in flight school, a lot of success. I mean, we're, we're seeing students as, as Scott knows for sure uh, that are doing deals uh, really quickly and, and coming out the back end of flight school, having done multiple deals. It's, it's exciting. Yeah, that's really great. And um the Facebook lives. I mean, I, I think those are really, really fun to do. It's, it's, it's getting to that point where like, I have to wonder, like, am I doing like, am I showing up my too much every single day in doing it? I don't know. I mean, people can't get enough. I mean, I don't know. Spoiling them, but, but uh, no, I think, I think it's, it's really engaged the community, honestly. Uh, and, and that's cool to see. Uh, so I, I hear on calls all the time that people are excited about those. All right, great. So I have to pick on Mimi more and Eric and Tate. Yeah. Come on more. I don't even know if Scott Todd will even take my calls anymore, really. <laughs> it's kind of. Well, I mean, you know, like, let, let's be real here. Like, uh, why not? Hey, you know, why, I think it was last week. We, we asked our audience to do something. What was the result? Oh, yeah. I, I haven't checked Facebook. I don't know. Have you? Have you looked? Did we have a No. Call? I mean, no. I must have won, though. I mean. I, I don't think you did, honestly. Yeah, like, I sounded sure. really good. And who won the tiger um, meme contest? Tiger King uh, meme contest. I, I, I don't know. Did you get fun. any tape? Not enough. I was kind of disappointed, honestly, because I think if anybody wins, it might be Scott Todd because he's been slaying it on the memes lately. And uh, Scott Bossman's done really well himself there. But, you know, I know his wife. And so I'm sure yeah, she had an inside trash. She had yeah. a she had a hand in that, no doubt. <laughs> but uh, she's like the funniest lady I've ever met in my whole life. So anyways, she's very yeah. Funny. Um, you know, I was hoping to see some other ones, but uh, the boys on the podcast kept me busy, kept me entertained. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, at, like, I, I, you know, you know what it is? I, you know what it is? The podcast just came out today. Yeah. Oh, that's, just, yeah, that's right. That's why. That's why. Okay. So, yeah. So we'll um, see. We've got to wait sure. two weeks. Yeah. By, by the way, has anybody had any anything like in quarantine change their life? Because I have to give Eric Peterson some props. But before I tell the story, Tate, have you purchased anything in in uh, in quarantine? They're like, oh my gosh, my quality of life is way be better now. Um, no, I don't think so. All right, I think it might be time to get that opal nugget ice maker. Yeah, no, I. I that's not here yet. I did order one of those yesterday, but shh, don't tell my wife it's for uh, her birthday. Oh, no, yeah, she's going to love it. It's it's yeah. that's one of those things like every day. I will say cleaning it once a week is a, is like not so fun, but it's not that bad. It's like 15 yeah. minutes. It's all right. Therapy, right? Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Mimi? Yes, I got an outdoor lounger. It's about eight feet long, five or six feet wide. That's going to go on the porch outside my bedroom, and it should be here this week. And my husband's going to have to put the thing together. I can't wait. It's got like cover to protect me from the sun. It's going to be glorious. That's that's wow, that's glorious. Where you're do all your work. The sunshine. Yeah. How about you, Eric? Anything? No, nothing comes to mind, but, uh, you know, like I told you earlier today, I'm, I'm kind of debating on that kettle. I, I wouldn't debate on it. I would get it <laughs> for sure. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, we use it every day. You've got to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about you, dude, buddy? 
kettle. What do you mean? Can you elaborate on like kettle bells or what are we? No, no, I'm going to tell the story in a second. Oh, okay. I don't want to ruin the story. Uh, Yeah. No, I, okay. I gotcha. Um, No, I I don't think I haven't purchased anything life changing. Well, I did purchase something that's in the mail that I hope is life changing. We have a, we have a dog that has a barking problem. Uh, So I I purchased an ultrasonic uh, uh, high frequency noise device that I'm hoping will, will change things because he's, he's an awesome dog. He's so smart. And uh, he's getting a lot of things down. He's just got a few things left to work on. So I'm hoping that is going to be my life changing device. So I mean, look at look at Tate laughing. He's like Scott Exotic. <laughs> I'm just I'm just dying. He's like he's got a lot of good characteristics about him, except he's still working on controlling his bark. I mean, yeah. is this a puppy or is this like a dog? No, he's a dog. He's three years old, and he is. All right, is yeah, that ship sailed, man. You're done. No, you can, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Well, the problem is, is it, it goes beep after it gets them, right? The bark will, he'll, he'll bark and it'll beep. And so instead of just barking, you get barking, barking and beeping together. We'll see. <laughs> I got a plan. I'll let you know how it goes. No one, no one on this call is optimistic about this thing, Scott. <laughs> I, I, like, I, you guys, let's just take a, like, let's like wager. Does he return it in seven days or less, 14 days or less, or like 30 days or less? I'm going to work. He, Go ahead, Tate. He's not returning it because he's too stubborn. He's going to make it work. Thank you. Mimi? I say within the month. He'll give it a good try. Good college try, but he'll return it. Yeah, don't forget Aaron's going to look at him with with disgust. I can't believe this thing. You know, we did this thing. It doesn't work. It's making it worse. Send it back, Scott. (laughs) And then he's like, okay. Now I got to go back on the round table and return it. Yeah. (laughs) Eric? So is this a, is this a collar that he's going to wear? No, it's a, it's a device that you hold, and basically when he barks, you it's like a remote. Like I'm going to have a remote for my dog, and I'm going to turn, turn it off because the problem is you're never going to have that remote near you when he starts barking. It's going to be it's going to be a t- I'm going to get one of those uh, belts, and I'm going to put my remote in the belt, and that's how it's going to be. I mean, Scott Todd's got 52 dogs. I think he's going to have the definitive answer on this. I do not have 52 dogs. I have two dogs. Thank you. Two dogs. Where'd you get the 50 from? Because you're transporting why? a lot. Why, why, on, why would I, like, throw some solutions to Scott Bossman that he's just going to pop me in the head again? I'm not, like, <laughs> we're enemies, man. He's, he's still <laughs> bitter. Such a, such a grudge holder. That was weeks ago. Oh, Oh, listen, it hasn't come back yet. It hasn't come back yet. You'll feel the one pain. Guy, one guy throws, throws shade at Scott Todd, other than Mark Podolsky. And uh, look what happens. He can't even handle it. I can handle oh, there's, there's even more shade in the shade. See? Yeah, don't, don't you worry. It's coming. Don't you worry. It's coming. Yeah, see, Scott, when I, when I cut, my cuts aren't very deep. But when, I mean, when really, cuts, okay, cuts I, I, I want you to say it. We, we, I want everyone to go back and review that episode because we were, you know, Scott Todd was assigning Tiger King characters to people who he, he's got to be somebody. But and not, then, come on, not Howard, please. Howard, man. Like, really? I mean, everybody else was taken except, yeah, for, I, I, except I, I, for the yeah, dead guy. If it was me, I would have been the dead guy. I would have doubled up. I would have been like the writer of the show. Anything but that guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you you compared me to like the dude who would be wearing flip flops and socks. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was the process of elimination. You you know what it reminds me, someone. Scott? I, was, I had a, like this is like years and years ago when I was working at my investment banking job, and and people were getting to know me, and this guy's like, "Hey, do you want to go hang out and go off road?" And I don't know him that well. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. So we're spending like a few hours together. At one point, I swear to God, he looks at me. He's like, he's like, so I'm, I'm just going to guess, like you were in band in high school? <laughs> I'm like, I look like a band guy to you? I'm like, no, I, I played basketball. I was like, I did track and I played on the tennis team. Like that's how uncoordinated he thought I was. I was like the band guy. <laughs> You that that is the same kind of cut to Scott Todd. 
I take offense to that. I was a band guy. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with being in the band. It's not what you're saying. But there's a stereotype about being in the band. Like I if, understand. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, nothing wrong with the drama kids, but there's a stereotype. Yep. It's just that you would ask the question. I'm just curious, like, what would you like to do in high school? And then you answer it. You don't just assume, like, you know. All right. Like, you, you've got a great singing voice. So, of course, you would be in the band. Of and that's course. cool. Like, there's a lot of cool things about all these clubs. Like, you know, my son's in robotics, and he looks like a robotics kid. Nothing wrong with it. It's just you would ask the question, right? Right. All right. Well, I'm, I feel- I'm, I'm quiet. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not elaborating on anything anymore. Because uh, Scott Todd is he's just uh, he's got a check he's he's got a f- full page of ammunition over there apparently he's coming plotting. at me. I'm plotting over here. He's plotting. I don't know. I feel like I've just offended probably everybody now you, you with the with the whole high school thing is, too. You offended a robotic kid. I ref- no, but I'm not offending yeah. them. I'm just saying that you know don't assume somebody's like something like the stereotype when you first meet. All them. All right. We're going to have to throw away yet another podcast, Mark. Great job. <laughs> Why? I'm not throwing this away. <laughs> oh, no, just kidding. It's actually just a way for Scott Bossman to give shade to everybody and be like, okay, I'm going to make some guesses. Tate, when you were in high school, you were blank. Yeah, I'm not doing that. I'll eat <laughs> <you>. <laughs> Here's a fun game. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Uh, Fill in the blank. Yeah. Mimi's got a very serious look on her face. Uh-oh. I'm fine. You didn't mention my sports. What were your sports? Uh, gymnastics and cheerleading. See? Now, how would you like it if I was like, so were you uh, president of the math club? Like after just meeting you. No one would mistake me as being the best. Well, I'm just saying, like, it's not that, not that it's like an, an insult, but you'd be like, wait, you think that, like, just from, like, that's the, that's the vibe I'm giving off after just meeting me? Right? Yep. So just, it's, 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 it's all in context. Yeah. Where if you're talking about, you know, Fermi's paradox and the, the elegance of the Pythagorean theorem, and someone's like, oh my gosh, were you president of the math club? You're like, yeah, I was. Like, you'd be like, you'd be taking it in pride. Like, if I heard Scott Boston singing, I'd be like, oh my gosh, were you on, were you, I hope you were in a band. Yeah. In, in band club. Or, you know. Why or yeah. Or whatever. So, you, you see tight cycling and, you know, you're like, did you have any friends? <laughs> like, these are legitimate questions. <laughs> Uh, all right. hey, hey, this is getting bad okay all right thanks everybody <laughs> oh man